Hello. The Department of Housing and Urban Development is pleased to present this second recorded webinar about the Department's Section 108 Loan Guarantee Program. This is our second of three in a series that you have the opportunity to view. The title of this webinar is Program Design and Application Process. The program staff that are participating in the presentation of this webinar are Shai Dot Abbas, myself, Hugh Allen, Bennett Hilly, and Jorge Morales. We also have special guest presenters from the city of Cleveland, Ohio, and from the state of Iowa. We're going to be giving you a brief program overview of the Section 108 uh, Loan Guarantee Program and also give you information that will be most useful for you for making an application either for a single project that you would wish to finance or for a loan fund in which you'll be doing many more loans and guaranteeing transactions uh, in your community. We think you'll find this information most useful and helpful for you to present to HUD an effective presentation and representation of what you're trying to do in your state and or your community. Also, we're going to preview you with you some of the additional information and webinar that we have available for you coming up. And be sure and watch and look at our underwriting webinar. And also, we have the first webinar that you can go back to review for your reference. And there will be other information and materials, including some project profiles and summaries that will be useful for you as you think through the type of uh, funding and financing you'll need in your community. In this webinar today, we want to emphasize to you that we're talking about loan guarantees, that is, the full faith and pledge of the United States government for the notes that you'll be issuing locally, your promissory notes. And these are not grant funds that we're talking about. Don't confuse this program with the Community Development Block grant. This is about loan guarantees. Furthermore, what will be helpful to you is that you'll find that the Section 108 Loan Guarantee Program fits within the framework of the Community Development Block Grant Program. So you're going to be seeing requirements and things that you're familiar to, that you've been uh, using and are familiar with seeing uh, through the Community Development Block Grant Program. And also, the key thing is you're going to have, learn how a state or a unit of local government or an insular area can access some very low-cost financing through the capital markets by HUD issuing its full faith and credit, its federal loan guarantee for your notes. One of the key features that you want to keep in mind is that this is a non-competitive application that you'll be submitting to the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and also that this application process is always open. It's a rolling application process. It's always open 365 days a year except for holidays and weekends. And another feature that you'll want to focus on is this. When you make this application to HUD, you are not being required to pledge the full faith and credit of your government, either state or local government, for the repayment of the Section 108 guaranteed loan. This is really a limited liability program, so keep that in mind. And also, one of the best features of this program is that you can get five times the amount of your current block grant in this low-cost financing. So if you're getting a million dollars a year in community development block grant funding, then you'll be able to get $5 million in the Section 108 guaranteed loan funding. The other aspect about this program to be thinking about is this. Um, there are generally three types, broad types of uh, project developments that you can use this financing for. Much of, of what we're going to talk about uh, during this presentation is already familiar to you, but it's going to be organized around economic development types of projects, those projects that create, create jobs and increase uh, tax uh, wealth to the uh, government, public facilities that are available to members within their community, and also the rehabilitation of housing. So now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Bennett Hilly, who will give you the next key points that you'll need to focus on. Bennett? Thank you so much, Hugh, for that overview of the program and, and getting us started today. So now we're going to move on to general kind of program design considerations. So before you even apply for a 108 loan guarantee, what should you be thinking about? And we're always encouraging communities to take a step back and keep in mind kind of the bigger picture. 108 may not always be the right resource or the right financing tool for your community's needs or for that particular need you're looking at at this moment in time. So here are some key questions. 
you know, does Section 108 financing really make sense for this project or program you're considering right now? One of the biggest ones which we encourage communities to really think about, do, do you or do your partners that are going to work with you on this project or loan fund really have the capacity to not only underwrite the loans, but also administer, you know, a loan fund for the long term? And that not only means um, financial management, but monitoring of that portfolio. So a few other questions that we just wanted to point out to begin with were, another one is, you know, 108 is really an ideal resource for a project that's going to be revenue generating, right? Because it is, a, it is a loan, and so you want something, you want cash flow to be able to repay that loan. So you either want to target 108 for one of those types of projects, or if you have a larger project, let's say perhaps water and sewer improvements that just can't wait in your community, you can't spend it over time like you would with your $1 million of CDBG funds. So instead, you really need a $5 million, $5 million up front to pay for those improvements, and then you'll repay it over time, either with CDBG or perhaps another public resource. And then the last item we really want you to think about is, you know, whether you have the capacity and whether you've started doing some of the pre-submission requirements. So, of course, this uh, funding is, you know, federal, so it's related to the CDBG program requirements. So you have several pre-submission requirements. You also need to do certain steps um, in the citizen participation process. So be thinking of those before you even start applying and review those in the pro program regulations. So as a continuation of big picture, let's think about the key first steps you need to do before you even start applying or put in an application to HUD for 108 financing. Uh, the first one is really review your community strategy, then you want to think about organizational arrangements, and I'm going to go into each one of these in more detail in the following slides. And then the third one is really to think about program design. You know, are you applying for an individual project or are you applying for kind of a larger loan fund so you can fund a portfolio project? So let's start with community strategy. So the first thing to really think about when you're looking at 108 as a financing tool is to, to take a step back and really think about what your community's needs are, because 108 is just another tool in, in your toolbox to address those needs. So you really want to think about your most recent comprehensive plans and, and what needs and goals those outline for your community. And really, if you know if someone comes to you looking for 108 financing, make sure that whatever their, their project is really is connected to what your general community goals are. Um, and also a key thing is to think about what's already in play in your community. Are there ongoing initiatives or programs or, or targeted neighborhoods where a lot is already happening where 108 could be a great resource to connect with those efforts? Okay, so the, the next key thing to consider after considering, you know, what your general community strategy is and what your needs are is, is who's going to manage this program? What are going to be the organizational arrangements involved? Are, are you, as the loan guarantee recipient or the state or local community, are you going to be the one administering the program in-house um, with your own staff, with your own economic or community development department? Or are you going to, also, or are you going to instead be using a sub-recipient, such as a, a local nonprofit a, affordable housing developer or a community development corporation or a CDFI? Or are you going to be using and working with another public entity? So that could be your, your redevelopment authority or perhaps your housing, um, public housing authority or even economic development authority. So you have lots of options. You can structure your program in several different ways. And so it could even be a hybrid of, of one of these. So now we're going to move on to the fun part, and we're going to start getting into the nitty-gritty of how to apply for the program. So first, I'm just going to give an overview before I pass it to Shaida and Jorge are going to go into, into depth on what the application components are. But first we're going to talk about individual projects and how to put in an app, Section 108 loan guarantee application for when you're thinking of just one, one particular project. So this is really the approach used by the majority of our, our borrowers in the program. Your application is just for that one project. It can be a larger scale project with multiple components. So you could have a mixed use development or you could have a whole neighborhood strategy, but you come in with the details on that on that project or that grouping of activities. It really, we really require a, a level of detail and specificity in those applications so that we can truly underwrite them and understand so that they're kind of ready to go. And for individual project applications after HUD approval, 
the guaranteed loan would then be used by the recipient or relent to a third party borrower for these projects. So we're just going to, here are just a few examples and I'm, I'm not going to read through all of them, but these are actually past or current example of 108 projects just to give you a real idea that it doesn't, it doesn't have to, it can be something as simple as a typical uh, transportation improvement project such as even sidewalk repair but it could be as, as complicated as you see here, conversion of a former power plant into an educational and recreational site for sailing, adventure sports, museum, and amenities, or even the conversion of a his, former historic school building into affordable rental housing. So we can really span um, a variety of activities here. So you can be as simple or as complicated as, as you want to be as long as you fit within the program requirements. And then the other uh, way you can come in with an application is for a loan fund. And this is really the, the application comes in and it doesn't have quite as much specificity or detail as the one would be for a specific project, but you come in more with uh, community development objectives and specific types of activities you're going to be funding, but you don't necessarily have to identify the individual transactions that are going to take place under the loan fund. And for this one, HUD provides approval and a commitment for kind of the overall loan fund but then you still need to come in with a more specific update afterwards to your field office. But we'll get into these details a little bit later in the presentation. And here are just some example loan fund objectives. Just like we said with the project specific, it can really be as straightforward as you want it to be, such as a small business loan fund, or it could be more complicated in terms of certain types of projects where you want to provide gap financing or where you want to encourage healthy food retail development and food deserts. So it's really up to you what you want your loan fund to look like. So now we are going to continue on with how to apply for a Section 108 loan guarantee. First we're going to start out with individual project applications since that's the type of application we see most frequently and then we'll move on to how to apply for a loan fund. So let's get started. So as you'll see on this slide, these are the, the six primary steps that we've kind of organized the process um, into. And we're going to cover each of these in more depth in the upcoming slides. But to give you a quick overview, here, here they are just so you can see them all at once. Okay, so the first step here is to really evaluate the projects you're thinking about applying for in terms of your community strategy and, and that and whether these projects are actually going to help address your community's needs and challenges, right? So we've just thrown a few out here that we're seeing um, that come in quite often and that community challenges that our communities are facing these days, which is one, you know, aging infrastructure and whether maybe your community's bridges need rebuilding, you need to do water and sewer updates, or it could even mean um, updating your road so that you have complete streets, so that you have sidewalks, and so that you have bike lanes for people to get to work and to school in different ways. Uh, it could be the need for workforce or affordable housing. A lot of communities are, are facing this, this challenge right now and, and really needing to, to rehabilitate um, affordable housing or, or build new affordable housing. Um, and so I've just walked you through a few of them, but your community could be facing a variety of challenges, so just make sure before you come in that this application, you can connect that, um, the community development objectives of your community to the application itself. So step number two is really determining whether the proposed use of funds is an eligible activity under the Section 108 program. For those of you who are familiar with CDBG, uh, none of this will come as a surprise, but here are the, the, here are the kind of four main questions you need to be asking yourselves. One is the proposed use of guaranteeing financing and eligible activity under the Section 108 regulations. Two, does it meet a CDBG national objective? And those are, of course, benefit to low and moderate income persons, and that is through a variety of ways, addressing slumber blight, or addressing an urgent need in the community or meeting an urgent need, and that can be you know, following a disaster or perhaps some other emergency situation. Number three is keeping in mind the overall 70% benefit to low and moderate persons between Section 108 combined with your CDBG. And the fourth one is, especially if it's an economic development activity, is it meeting public benefit standards under the regulations? Of course, if you want more information on all of these, they're very much covered on our website and um, in all other, a number of other TA materials that we have online. 
And another component of step two is also making sure that when you're proposing your project uh, that you're considering the cross-cutting regulations that will also apply since this you know is a federal program so things again these are not this is not a comprehensive list but here are some key questions you need to be asking yourself is you know what type of environmental review um, are you going to need to undertake for this project and that's going to depend on on the nature of the activity if a pick if applicable and this is mainly you know for construction of course who is going to ensure compliance with Davis-Bacon? Um, if your project's going to be displacing any residents, um, including tenants and or businesses, um, you need to be considering the Uniform Relocation Act requirements. And um, another example, of course, um, is how will the use of funds affirmatively further fair housing, especially considering the recent rule um, that HUD has put out. And now I am going to pass the mic over to one of our loan officers in the Financial Management Division, um, and I'm going to introduce Shaidat Abbas, who's going to start us uh, with sec Step 3, which is about underwriting projects for financial feasibility. Thank you, Bennett. The next step on Step 3 is underwriting the project for financial feasibility. Is my project ready? Do I have site control? How do I get site control? Is there appropriate zoning? Is there a demand for this project? Please do not build and assume they will come. Do a feasibility study if need be to demonstrate that this project will be viable and will be successful. And there's some others, so I'm not going to go into each and every one of them. There are, two, there are two examples of types of loans, real estate loans and business loans, that 108 funds can be used for. For these two examples, we do offer underwriting guidelines and even a webinar on how to better underwrite these type of projects. So now if you're underwriting your project, the next, the next step in the process is to is ensure that everybody who has a stake in the project is aware of it, your local stakeholders, your citizens, local groups, neighborhood community project, neighborhood community groups, etc. So at this point, you've underwritten your project and you are ready to submit the application to HUD. Step five here is a nice overview of what the process, the rest of the process. So you want to notify the field office that you intend to submit an application, submit it to the field and to headquarters simultaneously, and both parts of HUD will begin the concurrent review. At, during this process, you may have more questions that will come back to the potential borrower, so there may be some revisions involved. After the application is set, HUD will begin its actual approval process and issue the commitment. At this point, if the commitment is approved, you will get approval letter from HUD with documents to send back to HUD. When you send those back and indicate that you are ready to actually advance funds, we will create a note and a contract and other financing documents and send those to you for you to execute and return to HUD. At that point, you get financing monies either through our interim or permanent financing vehicle. So we've covered this application submission process. Now I'm going to dive into actually the content of the application itself. The first thing to keep in mind is objective, the big picture goal here. For example, is it to revitalize a waterfront or to target someone blind in a particular community? You want to be very clear about that and then talk about how this individual project helps to achieve those goals. So in addition to what Shaida just noted about the community development objectives and, and really how your project is helping to address those, some other big picture items we'll be discussing are, you know, what you need to put in a project description. Uh, Shaida will go into more about the project financial information, what we're looking for, and some of the other key requirements when you're submitting an application. So when we say project description, what does that mean? Typically what we're asking is to get a narrative, this information in narrative form so that we can read about what you're, what you're proposing and what your proposed use of funds is. But we also want supporting documentation of this. So have you done feasibility studies that show that a community facility is, is really needed and necessary in that area of town or that um, this business's expansion plans uh, really um, there is a market for the product that they're expanding to create. Um, renderings are really helpful, so if we can actually see images and see what you're proposing to build on the site, that's also great supporting documentation. 
um, as Shaida will discuss in the financial information underwriting reports. So really, the things you have to tell us about are the description of the activities to be financed, noting the eligible activity or activities, and we really would love to see a citation from the, the regs that will make it easier for us, the national objectives that you're proposing to meet, and of course, please use a citation as well, and of course, if applicable, how the project meets public benefit standards that are also noted in the regulation. So those are the musts, but as I noted, the more information on the project, the better. Of course, we also want to know who's actually carrying out the project that you're proposing. You know, oftentimes it is the borrower directly, and we'll see that especially with public facility projects, but oftentimes it's not. It's an affordable housing developer or um, a community development corporation or some other subrecipient or even a contractor who's carrying this out because they have more experience with um, construction, for example. So we just need to know who's carrying out, what are the, what's the project and organizational structure that's really going to administer the program and oversee the activity. And of course, we want to understand the project timeline and development phases. You know, while we're, we're not exactly a bank or a typical financial institution, we still want to understand when you need this financing by. When do you expect to, when are you looking to, to close and start getting advances from, uh, through the Section 108 program? What is your closing date if you're using a third-party borrower? Does that developer or that business need the funding on a specific timeline? Um, if you're building a multiple, you know, phase, uh, project with multiple phases, We'd love to understand the development phases, when, when, pre, when is pre-development and site preparation occurring, when is the first building being built, and of course, you know, general estimated start date, so when is the project going to become operational, when will, when will you lease up the property, and, and when will you start generating revenue to repay the loan. And now I'm going to pass it to Shai Abbas, who's going to walk you through um, more of the financial information we're looking for in applications. So the financial information, this is the meat of the transaction. This is your opportunity to demonstrate to HUD that this is a financially feasible project. What we want to see here is the sources of funds into the project. Are they committed? If they're commitment letters, please submit that as well. How the funds are going to be used. What are the revenue, and what's the expected revenue, and what are the expenses? If it's a new business, there should be projected financials. If it's an existing business that we're supporting here, there should be existing financials. The last three to five years should be submitted along with the application. Additional financial analysis include a debt service coverage, ratio analysis, a loan value analysis. All the underwriting materials that you've done, submit that with the application. The more, the better. And I won't go into too much detail here because this is just an overview of other things we're going to cover in the financial information, such as the repayment schedule, the need for collateral, and the loan financing fee. Sources. Along with, along with the Section 108 loan guarantee, you might be using a, a loan from a commercial bank, owner equity, or tax credit equity, such as new market tax credits, low income housing tax credits, historic tax credits, and other state tax credits. You might be using grant funds such as CDBG or other grant funds. There might be other public and private sources such as TIF, tax increment financing, or gambling revenue, for example. Tell us about all those different sources of funds, when they're coming into the deal, and if they've been committed to the deal already. On the uses side, we want to know exactly where the one is going to be used in the deal. So there might be other sources, of, there might be a lot of different sources of financing. We want to know if the one is going to finance the acquisition, for example, or finance the rehabilitation, or finance uh, the construction, but tell us where the one is going into the deal. It's a loan guarantee financing fee. This is new, for those of you who might be familiar with 108, starting in fiscal year 20, 2016, there is a 2.58% fee that is an upfront cost. It's not annual. It's a one-time fee. Now, that fee only applies when you actually advance the commitment. And that can be paid from CDBG funds or from another source of funding, or it can be financed as part of the guaranteed loan amount. Repayment. You must indicate in the application the sorts of repayment. That could be from the project revenues. Uh, if it's a non-income producing project, it can be from a CDBG fund, but you should tell us 
well, how are you expect to repay the project back? And you should also tell us what the annual principal repayment schedule you want. We don't dictate, dictate that to you. You should tell us what you want in terms of repaying it back. But there are some specific terms, such as it cannot be more than 20 years. On to collateral now. Collateral is required for, the, for a such one with loan guarantee. In addition to the required pledge of CDBG funds, additional collateral is required, such as a lien on the property or a leasehold or a lien on machinery, equipment, uh, accounts receivable or inventory, for example. We want to see in the application what additional security is being pledged. If it's a full faith and credit of the potential borrower, we like we need to see a resolution from the authority that says that yes, we can pledge that. So, in addition to the collateral, the sample collateral I mentioned earlier, other sources of collateral could be tax increment financing, parking revenues, uh, 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 debt uh, loan reserve or a special taxing district, for example, also guarantees from the third party borrower if there is one involved, a personal or a corporate guarantee. For the guarantees, we want to see a financial statement from the guarantor so we know that they actually have the monies to secure this transaction. So lastly, there are certifications that must be submitted with along with your application, and these are listed in the regulations at 570.704. And if you have any need assistance, the field office or headquarters staff can help you in terms of filling these out. But these are actually forms that have to be signed by the appropriate authority. So at this point, you submitted the application. It's been approved. And now how do you get your money? Once you tell the loan officer at HUD that the development timeline is about to start and you need to advance your funds. We will create a note and contract for you and send that to you along with other financing documents. You would execute those along after they've been reviewed by a legal counsel, return those to us, and that initiates the actual advancing process. So HUD is the guarantor of the Section 108 loan guarantee, but the money is actually coming from the private sector. And also keep in mind that you must record the request in IDEIS. We have more information about that available separately on our website. Now I'd like to introduce Tracy Nichols, the Director of the Department of Economic Development at the City of Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland is an excellent user of the Section 108 loan program, and this is a good case study on how to use the program. Hi, I'm Tracy Nichols. I'm Economic Development Director for the City of Cleveland, and we're going to talk today about using HUD 108, and in particular, how to use HUD 108 for job creation and economic inclusion. If you're setting up a HUD 108 program, if you already originate loans in your department, well, there's really nothing that you have to add. But if it's new to you, you're really going to need to have some type of staff to underwrite the loans. They need to have a finance background. You're going to have to have underwriting guidelines for your staff. You're going to need a lawyer to complete the documents between you and HUD and between you and the borrower, and a loan committee, somebody, volunteers, bankers, business persons, accountants, you always want someone to have a second look at your documents, and then staff to bill for the loans and wire the payments to HUD. You really should be able to talk to your local HUD office and talk to them about connecting you with a community that has a successful program. And Usually, they'll give you all their documents, tell you what the, the makeup of their loan committee is, and really help you get started. Most people i found in my career have been very generous in sharing their information. Borrow all the documents, get their loan committee makeup, you know, oh, you have four bankers, that sounds great. Pick their brains, really ask them to help you out. You'll find that people are really kind about that. Once you have a strategy and guidelines, you really have to talk to your elected officials about what the funds can do to help your community and really explain what the backstops are to make sure that you can pay back the community development block grant um, funds so that there won't be any impact. An NRSA strategy really, you, you come up with a strategy and you find out which areas of your city could be in an NRSA. It's all about just census tract demographic data 
you have to meet a certain criteria, and you just start putting together different census tracts and get the largest contiguous area in your city that is possible. We've done that for our city, and then we set about saying that we have a strategy of what we want to do in our community. The first is Evergreen Cooperative. So we're working with the Cleveland Foundation, it's our nonprofit partner, and to address some of the socio and economic problems of our community, in particular, we're looking at um, ex-felons. So we know we have a lot of ex-felons in Cleveland, and so we really want to work to get them gainful employment. Supporting existing small businesses, so we do a lot of storefront and economic development lending for our small businesses. It's just part of our NRSA strategy. You don't have to use HUD 108 to do all the projects you want to do in an NRSA. Health Tech Corridor Attraction. We have an area that's between downtown and our university hospital area, and um, we are working to bring businesses to that area. It was a very blighted area, and uh, we've now attracted over 70 businesses to that area. And it's been a very successful story, and, and HUD 108 has played a big role for us in that area. Our neighborhood revitalization strategy areas are on this slide. You can see all of the census tract areas. And as I said, what we did was we started out and we looked at which census tracts we could get in and how we could combine them so that we could get as many census tracts in the city into the uh, neighborhood revitalization strategy area. The importance of the neighborhood revitalization strategy area is that in these areas, if you're familiar with block grant regulations, you now have a presumed benefit of low moderate income benefit. So you don't have to ask every single employee of every business to fill out a form saying what their income level is. That is probably the one form that people hate to fill out. They don't like giving their private information. That's the way they feel because their company got some money. And so when you have an NRSA, you don't need to get that form, and so it makes it a lot easier to do these projects. The projects that we're looking at in these NRSA areas, it's harder to get banks to invest in some of these neighborhoods, so HUD-108 plays a big role for us. And we really look at having public-private partnerships in order to support our efforts. So we're working with hospitals, foundations, community development corporations, etc. so therefore all all working together will have more success. We also pair HUD-108 with new market tax credits. We find that that's a great way to really overcome obstacles to financing. Um, I would say also to take advantage of vacant and underutilized land in close proximity to anchor institutions. That's been a very successful strategy for us. And one of the things that we're doing is creating post-incubator space to retain and attract emerging companies. We asked ourselves, hey, where do these companies that are being incubated in our hospitals, where do they go? And what we found out is that they were going to the suburbs. So we wanted to create space that would keep them here. When you're using the HUD-108 strategy in an NRSA area, you have to remember a few things. HUD-108 must be paid back to the federal government. So it really has to be highly secured. So we do a few things that are really important and if you can work these into your program, it will really protect you and help make sure you don't have any issues down the road. The first is we use a debt reserve in the HUD-108 itself. So if you're getting, giving someone a $2 million loan, we might say 10% back, so 200000 We keep that in a debt reserve, and that way if the company has a hard time making a payment, we have some funds there to make the payment to HUD. We ask for guarantee guarantee of a high net worth individual. Sure, developers hate giving personal guarantees, but what we say is if you don't believe in the project, why should we? So we've really been able to get those guarantees, and it's helped us a lot. Positive arbitrage. What that means is if your HUD rate is LIBOR plus 0.2, we charge LIBOR plus 0.55. That means that every payment, we're getting a little bit of money that we put in program income that we put into a reserve fund. That's helped us a lot when we've had a few loans go bad. The last is a new tool we created called a TIF debt reserve. We actually put a TIF on to make loan payments or for other economic development purposes. We ran it through our state of Ohio and we were able to get that approved 
and that TIF comes into the city and it, we collect it as a debt reserve. And if we don't need it as a debt reserve, we could also use it for other economic development projects in the city. Doing several low-risk projects allows us to take more risk on a few economic inclusion projects. So you'll see that I'm going to have several projects that I'll show you that are to big developers that have deep pockets that are lower risk. And then you'll see a couple of our cooperative projects that are higher risk because there is no developer in a cooperative. And so it's a little bit different. Strong projects. Again, personal guarantees from high net worth individuals, strong collateral, TIF debt reserves, positive arbitrage, and we're accumulating a reserve fund that allows us to do those economic inclusion projects with higher risk, such as startups, cooperatives, etc. This is one of our low risk projects, Dunham Square Midtown Tech Center. This was the site of a used car lot and uh, basically a dumping area. It was vacant. Uh, there were submerged basements that have been from former demolitions. It was a nasty area, brownfield, and we were able to take this forward. It was funded in 2009. No bank would touch it. It was a spec building, 128,000 square feet, and we expected to have 150 new jobs. We're currently at 245 just in this building. It's part of our health tech corridor. We used HUD 108 to leverage new market tax credit. Again, it was able to go seven years interest only, which was very important. There was absolutely no bank financing available. City and state were the prime funders with the new markets. There's a capital stack in case you want to take a look. Uh, we also have a program called the Vacant Property Initiative, a forgivable loan that we put in. The developer put in 1.6 million, and we were able to put this together. We're collecting 0.2% additional interest on this project as we go, and the TIF debt reserve is bringing in 154,000 a year. Remember, when you do a TIF, it doesn't start coming in until about two to three years after the project starts, because the building has to be built and it has to go on the tax duplicate before you can get that pilot. So let's talk a little bit about economic inclusion projects. These are projects that you really want to do in your community, and they're difficult to get done. You really want to target people. For us, it was formerly incarcerated. We wanted jobs that actually provide a path to prosperity. We wanted to have companies that stay in the neighborhood. I don't know how many of you may have seen you help a company, and 10 years later, they get up and move to another community because they're chasing another tax incentive. So the types of companies we're looking at here are cooperatives. So there's no developer that has deep pockets who can just come in and give a guarantee. But we still felt they had a lot of value. So we're still putting in those same requirements of a debt reserve and the TIF debt reserve and the interest rate arbitrage. But we know that these are riskier projects. The first one we funded was the Evergreen Cooperative Laundry. It's a green laundry. And we put in $1.5 million of Pod 108. The Evergreen Fund is a fund that our anchor institutions have contributed to to invest in these projects. Again, it's a partnership between philanthropy, private industry, and the city of Cleveland, all working together to create these businesses. Here are some of the machines for the laundry. 29 jobs are created, 90% minority, 44% from our empowerment zone, 62% formerly incarcerated. Our Section 3 for this were over 60%. Again, those are some of the things that you're going to have to help developers and companies understand what Section 3 is, how do you meet the requirements, and you really, you know, we work with our workforce team to really help feed the people to the companies they're going to need to meet that Section 3. So HUD 108 has helped us to stimulate investment, and it really has helped us to leverage a lot of private investment as well. You need less HUD 108 per project since the recession. At the beginning, you could see I couldn't get a bank to come in, so I was putting in a lot more HUD 108. Later, I was putting in less HUD 108 to get bigger projects done. The most important thing is your developer has to understand the processing time is much longer. You have to go through an environmental review, which includes a Section 106 review, which is a historic review. So if you have any buildings on the site, they're going to have to be looked at especially if you want to tear them down. 
and Section 3 has to be followed in federal prevailing wages. These are all a little bit different for clients, and if your staff aren't familiar with them, you're going to have to make sure they're trained so you don't run into audit problems down the road. But sell HUD 108 with its flexibility and its low interest rate. I mean, the best thing about it is it's subordinated debt. And as I said, you could offer three years interest only, which would really help a developer because he's making small payments until that project is online and stabilized. And then, again, if you can use it with an NRSA, it really cuts down on paperwork, and it's really going to help you be able to fully implement and direct the funds we need them the most. So I think that's about it for today, but I hope everyone really enjoyed it and uh, learned a little bit. But what I'll say to you is I think HUD 108 is a great tool. I don't think enough people use it. And if we didn't have it, we couldn't have done a lot of the great things that we have going on in Cleveland right now. And so it's been very successful for us. So good luck in using your HUD 108. And if you have questions, don't forget, HUD's there. Ask questions. And ask them who's good in your region who could really maybe sit down with you and help you figure out how to start your program. Good luck. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Uh, let's continue on with uh, the application process, in this case, uh, for the loan fund. Uh, remember our consideration for the individual project applications. Uh, remember community strategy, what are the community's need, organizational arrangements, who is responsible, who are the, the, the parties, who are the parties who are going to implement the program. What approach are we going to be using for this 108 in case of the loan funds? At what scale? What size of the loan? What size I can manage? Also, we need to be aware of the marketing and outreach. What's the strategy? How are we going to reach out uh, to market this uh, loan fund? Also, the selection and evaluation. What's the process? How are we going to select the different uh, programs, projects? I'm going to make sure that they are the right one for my community. And finally, the fund management. What's the plan uh, at the short term and the long term? Uh, we need to make sure that when we implement the program, uh, that we comply with the required regulations. Let's talk then about the marketing and outreach. Uh, the long fund marketing considerations that we must keep in mind is uh, how are you going to market to potential borrowers? Uh, will you get the word out? How are you going to get this word out? Are you going to use papers, uh, newspapers, uh, radio, television? How are you going to make clear that you have this program available? Will you be requiring uh, requests for proposals, requests for applications? Are you going to identify existing community efforts that can be used uh, to promote the program? Are you going to promote partnerships, opportunities among different uh, entities? Concerning the selection and evaluation, how would you uh, intend to screen and who's going to do the screening? That's, that's very important. What, what the criteria will be used? What the criteria uh, is required? That according to your community. Uh, because remember, after all, we must keep the community priorities always in, in, in sight. The overall uh, project feasibility, you don't want to, to fund a, a project that doesn't have any chance of, of uh, success. So you have to make sure the financials are, are ready. What's the ability to repay the loan? Remember, you're pledging the CDBG funds, so you have to make sure that, that they have the ability to, to make those repayment uh, payments. And after all, you, you must ensure that they comply with health requirements. One of the things that you need to be clear is what on, underwriting standards uh, you're going to be using to underwrite your projects, to assess the risk of those projects. Who will conduct the, the underwriting? Will you be, will the uh, borrower will be doing it, or will you be required to contract somebody else to do the underwriting? And this is an essential and very important step, because after all, 
That's what you're assessing. You're assessing the risk of that deal. Thank you, Jorge, for those points uh, that you made to us about selection and evaluation. Let me just move to another topic that's very important as you consider uh, structuring your loan uh, fund. It's fund management. So what you'll need to consider under this topic is have you developed policies and procedures to administer the fund? Who will operate it? Who will administer it? Uh, how will decisions be made? And also, do you have a long-term management plan that will help you track the individual loans within your loan portfolio so that for any individual loan, you can ensure that debt service payments are being made timely, that there's reporting of outcomes in terms of number of jobs, uh, for instance, that are being created, or maybe amount of increased tax benefit. And then you'll want to have a, some system that will assist you with monitoring your individual projects that you funded for uh, continued uh, program compliance. Um, and remember that program requirements uh, with this financing um, similar to CDBG extend beyond the initial financing of the project. So in other words, it will extend after a project is construction or rehab is taking place, whatever the case may be. So let's look at some more specifically some of the uh, topics within fund management in terms of the policies and procedure. So you'll want some kind of internal um, application process, uh, if you will, a pre-screening uh, uh, application, if you will, if, if someone wants to make an application to get to you to finance them, then there ought to be a preliminary set of questions you might ask, like what is the type of development, uh, how will the funds be used, who will be the developer, of course the location, things like that. And you'll, uh, along that internal application, then maybe after you've done a pre-screening, you'll move it forward for further underwriting. So that's where you get into, well, from pre-screening, how would you select the project? How would you move forward to take it to the next phase? And part of the next phase, uh, I'm looking at bullet number three here, is the underwriting process and criteria. So underwriting process means who will be the staff or who will be the institution. Maybe it's a, a bank that's uh, partnering with you or maybe you're partnering with a community development financial institution to assist you with the underwriting. Uh, that's what you're looking for there. And then in terms of the process, if, if it meets financial uh, underwriting criteria, if it meets program criteria, then how would the decision be made for it to actually uh, be funded? And then once a project would be funded or you start developing uh, loans, you'll want to have a, a, an approach to your financial management, uh, um, uh, what report, financial reports that you may look for, or taxes being paid, things like that. Um, then you'll also, in managing your fund, um, you want to figure out how your monitoring will work and what kind of risk uh, you're concerned about that. Are your loans in a first priority lien position? Are they in a subordinate lien position? Uh, are there any events that are occurring at the project site that may uh, decrease the value of, of the um, asset? And then, of course, in terms of the reporting, that includes the Integrated uh, Disbursement and Information System, commonly referred to as IDIS. And so in IDIS, like block grants, you want to set up the project activities, and then going forward, you want to show either Section 108 uh, program income being um, paid back and in, in a repayment account, or you want to uh, report the creation of jobs or other benefits that may occur. Now, in terms of some of the tools under uh, the fund management, let's just think about this. Uh, you don't want to necessarily reinvent a wheel. Uh, there are communities uh, that are doing uh, um, project uh, funds, uh, loan funds around the country. Um, and so you can find out uh, from them, also from us, about identifying uh, a template for an application for a third-party borrower. And say, when I say a template, it might be so a certain set of questions that you always want to ask uh, initially about a project. Is there site control? Is there additional funding involved? Uh, who will 
uh, own or operate uh, a specific uh, project of development? Is it a business? Is it a for-profit developer? Is it a non-profit entity? And then there's templates you could develop for a commitment letter. You don't have to write a unique commitment letter each time you make a loan, but you might have a generic uh, type of commitment letter that would be customized to identify the specific project about which you would be addressing to issue. And then at loan closing, uh, what kind of documents uh, do you want at loan closing, like notes, uh, expression of uh, collateral, um, identification of mortgage, uh, other financing uh, that will be there. Um, then in record keeping, uh, these are things that you're familiar with. Um, we find it helpful that uh, from communities we've learned that those who develop some checklists to ensure um, that they're being able to meet compliance uh, and keep records to that effect, what was the eligible activity, what was the national objective, does the project um, and use of your financing, uh, sexual oriented financing required that uh, funding uh, demonstrate uh, public benefit and is it in compliance with the public benefit standards, either jobs or goods and services. And then it's good to also have a checklist so that you can monitor your portfolio on somewhat of a regular basis. Uh, how's the project operating? How's it going forward? Uh, is it meeting its compliance? Sometimes when a developer that you might uh, finance uh, does a um, commercial building and tenants would be in it, then it takes, uh, after construction, it takes uh, maybe three, four, or five years for all the jobs to be created that were estimated initially. So that's how monitoring can uh, be helpful to you. So under fund, fund management, we'll also want to look at some examples for tracking, uh, internal tracking on your individual projects. So would you have a system for identifying when payments are due, are they being paid monthly, and that's what we recommend that any time you relend this financing uh, to a third party like a developer, like a business, that you get repaid uh, monthly. Uh, and then you can accumulate that in your uh, guaranteed loan repayment account and then pay the debt service on your underlying uh, Section 108 guaranteed loan uh, to the Bank of New York Mellon. Um, so that's the kind of system you want. And the other thing is uh, tracking. Um, you'll want to have a system that identifies that property taxes are being paid on time, especially in, in the, when a third party developer or business is doing that. Um, you want to know if there's uh, tracking of any incidences or events uh, in case there's uh, some potential damage caused by fire or storm or something like that. So you want a system for just having an outline and overview of each property. And then finally, I've mentioned this a little bit earlier, but uh, there's guidance already out there for you. We've got other loan funds throughout the country at the state level and also at the individual local government level uh, in a city, county, uh, small nonprofits uh, that are being involved uh, in using the loan funds. Um, also, you can get additional assistance and information through your HUD field staff or us here at uh, the headquarters staff. There's also the HUD Exchange website, which has got the Section 108 Loan Guarantee Program there with a variety of resources, webinars, and then some other references for underwriting criteria for an application um, uh, webinar uh, that we're recording. And then, of course, there are partners that you can link up to help establish a loan fund. Sometimes we've seen communities join with two or three lenders, uh, banks, uh, community development banks, to help to run a loan fund to underwrite. You can join with other uh, community development financial institutions. Even uh, um, uh, community development credit unions are involved in this type of financing. So you've got access to existing loan funds, you've got access to HUD staff, and then there's always partners that are interested in assisting you, help you meet your community goals and needs, and joining in as a partner to uh, do a loan fund with you. Continue with the loan fund application, which is built upon the great opportunity a loan fund, uh, loan fund programs allows the community 
because it allows the community to build a portfolio that will cover a broad variety of needs. Uh, they will build uh, the determination based on what projects they want to target, what areas they're going to target. Uh, and of course, that will be that will be the first step to, to determine the focus of that fund, uh, identify the eligible activities and the target areas. They will complete the citizen participation process and the local reviews. They will submit the application to HUD. We will issue. Uh, we will go through the issuance, issuance process. But one of the uh, main aspects that we want to uh, emphasize is that for each individual project that the community uh, approve, a complete part, uh, series of participation process has to be has, has to take place, and they will require HOTS uh, field office uh, eligibility determination for each individual transaction. Once again. This is that. This is one of the uh, main features of using a loan fund program because you don't have uh, the specific project, and you can uh, cover a lot of different needs with just one one uh, single program. Okay, let's let's take a look now at the loan fund application content. See what information we would like to see in that application. Uh, we will need to see the loan fund description, which includes the funding amount, the community development objective, the eligible activities, the national objective, if required or if applicable, the public benefit standard information, also the capacity uh, and the identification of partners and, and, and players, their role, a description of the underwriting process and criteria that's going to be used in select uh, those uh, projects. Also the long terms that you're going to be uh, using. Uh, we would like to see a pipeline of the potential projects that you may have coming your way. Also what collateral are going to be acceptable uh, for your loans. Also a repayment schedule and they require certifications. Let's see now the uh, eligibility determination process. Once your loan fund program is approved, you must submit the following information to your field office for each individual project that you are uh, submitting. Uh, the project description, the eligible activity or activities, the national objective, and if applicable, once again, the public benefit standards according to the CFR. With that, once that information is provided to the field office, the, the field office will then uh, provide a determination letter, which in turn will submit to us, and we will then proceed uh, to the advance request if once is forthcoming. Now we're going to uh, have the, the opportunity to, to see a, a case study from the state of Iowa. All right. Well, we at the State of Iowa uh, Economic Development uh, Authority decided to get into the HUD Section 108 Loan Guarantee Program because we were looking for another development tool to offer to, particularly to non-entitlement communities who, of course, have no auto access to CDBG funds, and we're attempting to put more money out in the communities or more money to work, so to speak, across the state. And we call our program the um, Community Revitalization and Economic Enhancement Loan Fund because uh, that's what we hope it, it uh, can accomplish. Um, we've asked HUD for $40 million in lending capacity over the next five years. If you compare that to our annual CDBG allotment, it's nearly twice as much as our allotments, uh, currently about 21 and a half uh, million. Um, applicants, obviously, since it's CDBG, must be a general local government, meaning municipality or, or county, non-urban county. And um, that um, 
indicates, of course, that it's for small cities and non-urban counties only. And um, we want to facilitate the availability of capital for, for larger and more comprehensive, impactful projects than we have been able to fund through our regular CDPG components. And we feel that the Section 108 can address those unmet community needs uh, that existing resources are not fully serving or in some cases are not serving at all. We believe there's uh, presently a gap in resources available for, for larger scale projects, uh, particularly for the rehabilitation or renovation of affordable housing. And we're especially interested in adaptive reuse and conversion of former non-residential buildings to residential. Uh, one particular thing we find in Iowa is through schools consolidations, there are a number of communities now with, with vacant schools and uh, several of them have been converted and we want to uh, spur that on to, to continue to see those schools reused as, as apartments. So actually in 2012 there was a statewide housing study done that in, identified an increased need for affordable housing throughout the states. And our aging housing stock uh, relative to other states is a major contributor to the affordable housing shortage. And that has resulted in our program's primary focus on housing rehabilitation and adaptive reuse. Uh, Iowa has an exceptionally large number of small rural communities with housing at least 50 years old and often 75 years old or, or more. And we have seen that in smaller communities when economic development does occur, uh, you can be faced with a situation where there are few, few places for new workers to, to reside in, in that community. So the, the uh, financing split um, reflects obviously our, our emphasis on housing as 81% of the program funds are expected to serve housing projects. The other 19% would be for economic development projects, um, mostly probably industrial, some maybe commercial. That would be expected to create at least 380 new jobs and that would be at the um, minimum amount per job. So if we, uh, we're reserving some flexibility where we can give more than $5,000 a job, which is our state minimum, and then that uh, number of jobs could, could expand. So you can see the, the table there and the percentage of the total $40 million that's been allocated to us, uh, how, that, how that breaks down into our four major components. So the objectives of those four components are uh, the large, as I said, the larger dollar, larger impact projects for economic development through business location or expansion, um, adaptive reuse and conversion of vacant or underutilized buildings for residential purposes. And, and we're talking here about um, normally like something of a former use related to, to education, uh, perhaps a warehouse, perhaps a hotel. Uh, those are the kind of uh, situations that we commonly see. The third objective would be rehabilitation of upper story residential units all within a uh, single market area. And uh, we, one of our emphasis, emphasis um, statewide is to encourage mixed use and upper story development, particularly in traditional downtowns as that's becoming a um, kind of a, a trendy thing, so to speak. And then finally, uh, the availability of affordable single family housing units or remediation, perhaps even um, demolition of those, those units to clear the way for, for new housing. Our activities, again, um, direct business loans, uh, adaptive reviews or conversion, upper story residential rehab in mixed use structures where we prefer where the uh, the typical traditional downtown has a 
storefront on the ground level and then uh, loft apartments above, and then rehabilitation or demolition of single family uh, residential units. At IEDA, we always prefer rehabilitation or remediation of properties, particularly single family units, uh, rather than uh, demolition, which we regard as um, uh, the last last resort. But we have we have allowed that within our program because we do realize that sometimes um, residential structures become truly uninhabitable and uh, are beyond the the point of uh, reasonable repair. So the applications will be reviewed by us on a first come first serve basis. It'll be a rolling what we call a rolling application window and we will make awards uh, until all the funds are committed. And we have five years to, to um, distribute the monies that we have. Loan terms are intended to be um, seven to 15 years, depending on the type of project that you are undertaking. We expect that the direct business loans would have the shortest terms and that the adaptive reuse projects would probably be more likely to have the the 15 year term. Again, just because of the um, construction time periods and the length of time it takes to to uh, start uh, showing a positive uh, cash flow. Um, as part of our process, uh, we do require a meeting be held between the unit, the unit of local government and IEDA prior to submitting a, a full application. Our review team, which would consist of, of five individuals, will complete the underwriting and present the project recommendations ultimately to, to HUD for the eligibility determination. And really we want, we want to screen potential projects early on before there's a large amount of time and money and energy expended um, just to, for, in the interest of, of everyone concerned. And our primary uh, tool for the initial review will be what we call a project uh, questionnaire, but uh, you could call it a pre-application uh, if you'd like. And it, it is relatively short, but it gives us enough information to, to make a, a determination of viability and eligibility before we, we get too far along. Okay, and then uh, in terms of the contacts for this program, um, you can see them there. Uh, the division coordinator, the community investment team leader, which of course I'm a member of that team, and then myself as the project manager. I will be the, the contact person in the state of Iowa. I will do all the initial screening and try to determine basic eligibility before it is taken any further. If the project looks good, I will then set up the, the next steps so that the, the project can, can move forward. Thank you so much, Ed. We really appreciate you joining us today and giving us an overview of the State of Iowa's Loan Fund. We're now going to transition to a general wrap-up and talk about some, some next steps. And we're going to hear from Hugh Allen, the Deputy Director of the Financial Management Division again. We hope that today you've learned from this webinar and you've learned about how to draft your application and apply directly and submit it to HUD. Uh, I want to again thank uh, uh, Bennett for her big picture overview, giving you a sense of a program design and specifically Shai Dot and her project specific uh, way to structure an application. And then finally, again, thanking Jorge for his presentations of fun, which should help many of you that have a, a large need out there, either in, specific, in a specific neighborhood or numerous neighborhoods, that you'll find that a loan fund will help you build a portfolio and address many of your needs without having to come in each time for a new application for each thing and each project that you're going to fund. Also, I, I do again want to thank uh, Tracy Nichols, the director of the uh, a development program out there in Cleveland for those uh, excellent examples and case studies she gave that should give all of you a real insight into the power of this program and this type of financing and how to expand the impact of your community development program in your neighborhood. And also 
the state of Iowa gives you a, a very clear example of how a state can fund numerous projects throughout a state and spread the risk of their loan fund. That's really a good uh, focus for states to be thinking about and to be using. Now going forward, we have another webinar that we're going to be drawing to your attention and also be recording and publishing on our website. It's going to be on underwriting criteria for real estate developments, uh, the income producing type of properties uh, versus uh, direct business loans, which gets you into a different credit structure and uh, we can show you a, a very insightful way to do that underwriting. So be looking forward to that. We think you'll find that very useful. There are other uh, information and and uh, items that we're going to be putting on our website, project summaries, and there may be some other interviews with other communities around the country that we'll be placing there also. So be on the lookout for things of that nature. We hope you find that this Section 108 Loan Guarantee Program is the program to complete your impact uh, of your community development block grant program in your community. If you have questions, please be in contact with us either by phone or by uh, email or through our website. Thank you for your attention and your time and the best of luck in putting together those Section 108 Loan Guarantee applications.